Joey Logano wins. Tyler Reddick flips. Was the NASCAR Cup Series race at Las Vegas a good race? Welcome back to Break Hard, everybody. My name is Matt. Let's talk about what we saw on track Sunday at Las Vegas Motor Speedway for the NASCAR Cup Series. A lot of things happened. Joey Logano finds himself locked into the championship race at Phoenix after having to be given a lifeline from Alex Bowman last week. Tyler Reddick flipped over. Some other things happened as well. Two drivers are pretty much in must-win positions right now, but off the top, was this a good race? I'm probably going to give it an 85. That's what I gave it on the TikTok ranking. I'm going to give that here as well because it's a Gen 7 race on an intermediate. Those are pretty much always guaranteed to be very good. It's kind of the reason why I think the Roval should go back to the Oval because this car races so well on the Oval, especially at Charlotte, at Las Vegas. It's no different. We saw multiple different leaders on Sunday. We saw fuel strategy play out the end. We saw multiple different lanes and you could actually pass. It was a very entertaining race from start to finish. And we finally got a natural finish at the end of the race without a late race caution to set up a green flag, green, white checker finish finish, kind of like what we saw on Saturday in the Xfinity Series race, which saw A.J. Elmendinger lock himself into the championship race, much like how Joey Logano, a eight seed, locks himself into the championship race and has kind of threw a wrench into the championship standings, but we'll get to that at the end. Let's start off with talking about what happened during this race, because some things happened. Starting off the race, Christopher Bell is your leader, and he set sail like Christopher Columbus Bell does, and he was in search of the promised land, that being Phoenix, or at least a golden ticket to Phoenix to report back to the Queen about. He ultimately would not end up there. Instead, he would have to settle for second on Sunday. We'll get to that in a moment. The first stage went pretty much how you would expect it to go. We did have one incident in stage one, though, where Daniel Hemrick just, I think, wanted to get some TV time for his sponsor, who was also the title sponsor, South Point, on Sunday, just drove through the three-car for Austin Dillon. Like he was, well... Austin Dillon back at Richmond a few months ago. Just absolutely punted him out of the way like he was trying to break in a new pair of boots from Boot Barn. You're welcome for the plug, RCR. After the race, Austin Dillon got out and he was like, he flat out wrecked me. Yeah, dude, what do you think you did to two people at Richmond? Sometimes that thing, things like that happen. The 31 did just absolutely junk the three car, though, and Austin wasn't happy about it. Don't blame him. Tyler Reddick goes on to win stage number one, and he would really need those points. Because on the ensuing restart from the stage one caution, we had a massive, massive accident. Martin Truex Jr. decided to let everybody know that all the track was his on Sunday. He washed up off the corner, got into the nine car of Chase Elliott, who then moved up and hit the 45 car of Tyler Reddick. They all went spinning. The 45 then goes into the infield grass, hits where that quarter mile track is in the infield right there, catches air, decided he wanted to fly like an eagle, a lot like Michael Jordan, literally took the Air Jordan sponsorship literally when he got into the air and flipped over on the front stretch. Thankfully, it was only one flip, lands back on all fours, grabs the gear, drives it to his pit box, and the suspension on the car was ruined, of course. I mean, it's the next-gen car, and you tap the wall, you break a toe link, you flip a car and land back down on the ground, it's going to break more than just a toe link that they could repair uh, in the pit box. His day was done. He even asked over the radio, so does that mean you have to get out of the car? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, Tyler, you have to get out of the car uh, now, big wreck for him. Ryan Blaney didn't even realize he flipped over until after the race when he was on his post race, which is kind of odd as well. So Chase Elliott, Brad Keselowski, the 45 of Tyler Reddick. Ryan Blaney was also caught up in this incident as well. He broke a toe link trying to avoid this wreck and he smacked the front stretch wall and Austin Sindrick, all included in this uh, major wreck. Then this race kind of just played out naturally. You had some guys passing, some people fading, uh, pretty good on track action. And then as we get into stage number three, Chris Rebell wins stage stage number uh, two, which he had the best car all day. I mean, he led a race high 155 of 267 laps. If I gave everybody a guess on who led the second most amount of laps on Sunday, I'm not sure people would get it, but it was Daniel Suarez with 57, which is a really good performance by him. Yeah, they used strategy to get themselves out front, but hey, he got himself out front. However, before we get to the end of this race, uh, Denny Hamlin was having a hard time in the pit box, just having a hard time trying to find the box, the pit box, that is. And he was stopping short too long. It just everything seemed to not be going well. The pit crew was having a few mishaps there. Every time he came down pit road, they were losing spots. Kyle Larson uh, similarly had some issues on pit road. They had a pit early on in this race when they had a piece of aluminum stuck in the nose of the car. They take that out. They slap some uh, bare bond, some airplane tape on it. Should be good to go there. 
comes down for a pit stop under green flag conditions, they don't get the right rear tight. So they have to run back around and tighten down the right rear. Well, then they come back in the next lap because they didn't get the left rear tight and they have to put a new left rear on it, putting him two laps down in this race. And that's kind of where the battle happens. At the stage two caution, he's able to get a lap back. So now he's only one lap down uh, to the field. Then he's battling it out with the 54 car of Ty Gibbs and they're switching back and forth. And it's really like Ty Gibbs trying to make sure that Larson doesn't get back on lead lap. They don't want to give him uh, a rebirth. They don't want him to spawn and have a new chance at winning this race. And that's all fine and good until Ty Jameer Gibbs spins off the corner and brings out the caution. And guess who gets the free pass? Kyle Larson with this be like Halloween two, where they gave him a second life and he comes back to haunt everybody and win this race. No, he would have to settle for 11th place, but he did have a very fast car. Uh, just ultimately with the strategy, it never really worked out for him. Speaking of strategy, the final stage of this race played out really, really interesting. So you had the leaders of Christopher Bell and others that pitted. That way they could get fuel and they could get tires. They knew they were good to the end with about 40 laps to go or under is when they all started making their pit stops. So they were good to go. He comes out of the pits. Now there's alternate strategy. You have guys like Daniel Suarez, Joey Logano, John Hunter Nemechek that are all on this other strategy of like, we think we can stretch it. They knew they were about four laps short. They're like, we can figure this out and try to get to the end here. Thankfully for John Hunter Nemechek, somebody else was doing the fuels uh, calculations other than when he was at Nimco in the truck series because they one time ran out with like 12 laps to go. And that's just embarrassing. But as this is happening, Christopher Bell is like 26 seconds back and he's eaten into it. He's eaten into it. He's eaten into the lead. Daniel Suarez is out in front. Joey Logano is trying to catch Daniel Suarez. And all of a sudden, he's got the 12 car of Ryan Blaney behind him. Now, Blaney is shoving the 22 down the straightaway. So they get into the corner. Logano goes low. Blaney goes high. And then coming out the corner, he takes that big run and he shoves the 22 down the straightaway once again. And they catch up to the 99 car. They eventually pass the 99 car. Now, Logano's in the lead. And Suarez is in second. Blaney still is like eight laps down. He knows I can't gain any spots. I'm not going to lose any spots here because the next car was like 37 laps down. So, uh, you know, when you subtract the number, they can't pass. Fine. Great. So now he's pushing them along. Meanwhile, Chris Rebell is still trying to come up there real fast. He's trying to reel in the 99. He's trying to reel in the 22 of Joey Logano like he's Kevin Van Dam in the Bassmaster Classic and ultimately comes up pretty much about a lap short. He gets to... Uh, the 22 within striking distance on the last lap. And going into turns three and four, Ryan Blaney goes high and takes the same lane that Christopher Bell does, all but ensuring that Bell won't be able to get a run off the corner. He wasn't close enough anyways. He was, even with a huge run, he was maybe only going to be able to get to the back bumper of the 22. And once again, has to settle for a second in the elimination race at Las Vegas, just like he did last year uh, with Kyle Larson in this race. So Joey Logano locks himself in to Phoenix, once again, continues his trend of being in the championship race in an even number year. I'm sure Jordan Bianchi is going to absolutely hammer Jeff Gluck about that on the teardown this week. But for Logano, massively impressive. Like I said, last week he needed a lifeline. I told you guys in the tier rankings when I said, put him on a watch list. Yeah, put him on a watch list. He is massively dangerous in the playoffs. And he gets in thanks to, you know, Alex Bowman getting disqualified after the Roval. And now he's into the championship race in Phoenix. And the point standings right now are a bit of a mess considering there are three guys you know, that are sitting there pretty well in hand. And then you have three guys on the outside, four guys technically on the outside that are just going to need a lot of luck. There's going to be some talk this week probably about if Ryan Blaney maybe went over the line, pushing his teammate, um, you know, essentially to victory here. Some people on the internet said that it was race manipulation. It is not. It's really just a teammate helping his teammate out. He ultimately didn't get in the way of somebody else trying to pass him. So I understand why some people are upset, but Think about it like this. If the roles were reversed, and let's say that was Alex Bowman pushing Chase Elliott the same way, would people be as upset about it? I don't think so. I think because it's Joey Logano, they will be upset. But Ryan Blaney continues to be a company man over there at Team Penske, and I'm not sure it's reciprocated the same way uh, when he's in these positions that Logano finds himself in right now. But that's probably a story for a different day. On to the point standings, though. Joey Logano locks himself in. On to the point standings, though. Joey Logano locks himself in. He will be racing for a championship at Phoenix. Behind him, you have Christopher Bell, plus 42. Kyle Larson, plus 35. And then William Byron, plus 27, as it currently stands. Below the cutoff line, you have Denny Hamlin, minus 27. Tyler Reddick, minus 30. 
Ryan Blaney, minus 47, and Chase Elliott, minus 53. I would say Elliott and Blaney are pretty much in must-win positions right now. Reddick needs a really, really good homestead. He needs to capitalize on stage points. The same with uh, Denny Hamlin. But I'll be honest right now, Chris Rebell could find himself advancing on to Phoenix after Homestead next week with a good run. He doesn't even necessarily need to win, but if he uh, maximizes his points in the stages and then finishes probably in like the top three, yeah, he's more than likely going to lock in just on points. We could be in for a maybe, you know, pretty mid Martinsville in terms of like, it's not, we don't need it to be eventful because we kind of know who's already going to be here barring something drastic happening. For everybody, for the three that are currently in as it stands, Bell, Larson, and Byron, all three of them have won at Homestead in the Gen 7 era. All three of them expect them to be very, very good there. And all three of them have won at Martinsville as well. So, yeah, it's going to be tough for the other four guys below the cutoff line to try to catch up to them and get around them uh, in the point standings. But overall, I thought Las Vegas was really good. Um it feels a little bit out of place, like going all the way out west for Vegas to come all the way back east for Homestead, Martinsville, and then back out west for Phoenix. But overall, the Gen 7 car on a intermediate track on a mile and a half once again continues to deliver. So I'm interested to hear what people's uh, thoughts on today's race were. Joey Logano winning, uh, Ryan Blaney pushing him to the win, Christopher Bell coming up short, the Tyler Reddick flip. Let me know your comments. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments, rather. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.